This is Doug Green with What Really Matters Interviews, and today I'm really stoked to be interviewing Ed Kennedy. Ed Kennedy is a dear friend from 30 plus years ago. I met him back when I was married, and I met him in the wilderness, which is perfect because that's exactly what we're going to be talking about today. Um, Ed has been a ranger. Ed has been in wilderness all his life. And what we're going to be talking about today is the power of wild places and why they're so important. Wilderness, wild places, getting out there in nature, out in the elements, and being in places where you're not always in control of everything. Ed has spent a lifetime out there, basically. And today we're going to go through a lot of different areas. We're going to start with his trip in British Columbia um, and Alberta province in Canada, which he did this previous summer. And he's he intentionally sought out ways to see grizzlies. So go figure. This Most people are like, I don't want to get involved. I don't want to be a part of the food chain. And he intentionally goes out there alone, which actually pushes up the risk of um, what happens when you encounter a grizzly. And he sought him out. So Ed, first of all, thanks for joining us, and I'm really looking forward to this. Well, I am as well, Doug. It's good to hear your voice. Ed, tell me about going to BC, going out there and wanting to see grizzlies in the wild when you're hiking by yourself and backpacking by yourself for extended periods of time. What was that like? What inspired you to do that? And um, just take it away. Uh, you know, Doug, I guess it's, uh, it's going to be hard to explain. And, and if someone doesn't feel it, it might be hard for them to understand. But, uh, I've always been drawn to wild places, um, my entire life when I was a young child, um, had a, had a pretty difficult childhood and, and, uh, a lot of, a lot of chaos and turmoil in the house and, uh, mountains were what I escaped to in my mind. And, um, realize that if uh, looking at photos of wild places and wild animals and, uh, and and thinking about them could could bring me the the peace and the the escape and it truly was escape at that time uh, then just I could only imagine what actually being in those places and experiencing the the wildness um, personally could could do for me and so at the earliest opportunity I did that in 1973 um, moved to Idaho, finished high school out here, and um, immediately set about spending as much time as possible in wilderness. Let's let's go specifically to this trip you were on, um, and then we'll come back and cover the because uh, the formative years. <laughs> Grizzly bears are the the ultimate expression of wildness, and in, in my mind, they're the the culmination of the the flow the evolution of life through time uh humans can't claim that mantle because we have these big brains but we do really really dumb things with them um like destroy each other by the millions and and destroy the the uh the the atmosphere and the environment and all the ecosystems that that our life depends on and we go ahead just blindly doing it grizzlies have have such an amazing connection with their environment and they're so attuned to everything uh, that that goes on around them, uh, the smells, uh, the the uh, where, where to find what foods, um, they they just have this connection with with the earth and the land that I'm really jealous of. I'll never be capable of that. And to to get to be in the presence of an animal who, for one thing, is is so powerful that uh, the only we are the only creature that can that can be as formidable as them, as them. and just because of our technological advancements, we we uh, developed guns to kill each other with primarily, but also to kill uh, fellow members of the 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 uh, community of life. Um, but a human without a gun is is even a human with with a gun often is no match for a grizzly bear. These amazingly powerful animals. So let's let's go in. Let's go on the trip. Take us into this trip up in British Columbia and talk about um, your interaction with one. Like I think you described one where you, you you did everything you could to make sure that they were aware of you prior, right, so that they could move out of the way and do their own thing. But there were a couple times when, despite your best efforts, um, you know, being downwind from them and being where there was a lot of background noise, they couldn't hear you. 
what was it like when you, and describe the situation, take us right into that moment, what you saw, what you felt, um, all of that, make it real visceral. The most startling one, Doug, actually occurred in um, Glacier National Park before I even made it to Canada. I was hiking up a stream, um, had a downslope wind, so the uh, the bear couldn't smell me next to a stream in a little gorge. So it was pretty noisy. The bear couldn't hear me Could, because I do make noise. I, I hike alone, but I don't um, I don't invite close contact with bears because they don't like surprises. Um, so I had a downslope wind. The bear couldn't smell me. Uh, pretty noisy. He couldn't hear me. Um, I say he. I don't know if it was a if it was a male or female. I'll just say he for general purposes. Um, and I was hiking up a fairly steep trail, stepped over a little rise, and there's a bear about 30 yards away. And um, that, you know, your stomach immediately, immediately tightens up. Um, my, my heart immediately went to full race, grabbed my bear spray, um, which I always have ready at hand. Um, and the bear just turned and looked at me, saw me right away, turned and looked at me and went back to digging. He was, he was digging roots. I uh, went back to digging, obviously didn't care I was there. It was a great relief for me. So I backed down the trail a little ways, got my camera out and walked up the slope just a little ways where I had a good view of him and, and took a few photos um, with my bear spray hanging in my little finger, of course. Um, so I had it ready at hand and he just ignored me and then he turned and walked away and that's the response you want. It's not always the response you get. Um, but it's often, probably most often what, what, what they do if they don't run away from you at, at, at high speed, bears are not as dangerous as they're made out to be. We, we hear these horror stories about people that are attacked and it does happen and they're certainly capable of it. But the, more often than not, your encounters with them are going to go like that. And that was that was the, the most startling one because it was such close range. The other really um, gripping experience that I had was I was in, in um, British Columbia. <clears throat> excuse me, I won't name the stream. Hiking on a trail, going to cross a creek. And I noticed a bear on the other side of the, of the creek. And he saw me right away. He stepped out of the willows, saw me right away, and his head head came up. He's he's got me he's got me uh, fixed in his eyesight, and so I started talking to him right away. I don't at first I'm sure he couldn't hear me because of the noise of the stream, but he saw me. Don't know if he could smell me or not. I, I didn't uh, I didn't make note then of what the wind was doing, which was a mistake. You just should always know what the wind's doing when you're in grizzly country. Um, the bear crossed the stream towards me keeping me fixed in his gaze. And I'm walking backwards, my arms spread out, talking to the bear saying, hey bear, it's just me, just me, um, not shouting. Um, he kept coming across the creek towards me and he kept coming. And if they keep coming, you, you, it's better to stop and hold your ground because if you keep backing away and they keep coming, then it could trigger a predator prey response. Um, so I stopped and at this point, he was within 30 or 40 yards of me. He was across the creek. He was on my side of the creek. I stopped and had my bear spray out. And, and I had my camera out because I actually uh, hike with a 600 millimeter lens slung over my shoulder. And um, so I, I'm, I'm taking photos. But at this point, I stopped taking photos and I have my bear spray. And I said, just as I said, don't make me spray you with this shit. He stopped turned around, went back across the creek, went downstream a ways, crossed back over to my side, and then went on the way he was going all along. So he was curious about me, I'm sure, but he all he really wanted to do was go on his way. In hindsight, I probably should have just moved off the trail, and he probably would have just walked right on past me on the trail. Um, hindsight, of course, being 20, 20, that's not what I did. But it worked out great, but it was just an amazing experience for this bear where he – you know, he was he was testing me out, like, are you going to get out of my way or not? And and I was too dumb to to get out of his way. Um, so he went around me. Um, you know, an animal that that could with one with one swipe take me out, just completely incapacitate me. To have him just just say, okay, you're not going to move, so I'm going to go around you. It, it, it was uh, you know, after my heart settled down, um, it was a pretty awesome experience. Those are the experiences I, I live for. 
Good thing you don't have any heart issues. That would be one that would challenge it. <laughs> yeah. So that sounds pretty crazy. Um, that would challenge anybody's heart. It's what, it, when you're in a situation like that, I know that you have a pretty good capacity to keep cool under pressure. Did you feel, did you, did you feel like you were kind of on the edge of like, ah, uh, like you wanted to run or did, were you in this, good enough control of everything obviously you were that you didn't do anything stupid at least anything that was sort of in a fight flight response approach you um i don't know when you how do you keep your cool in a situation like that not everybody can do that well running never entered my mind one thing i'm a great believer doug in visualization so i visualize encounters like that um just like I ski in avalanche country a lot. And I will actually visualize being buried in an avalanche and slowing my breath. I'll visualize, I don't want it to happen. I don't think it will. I'm, I, I think I use pretty good judgment and the crew I ski with are all pretty solid. But I, I visualize that and visualize my, myself breathe, slowing my breathing and maintaining control. And I really, really believe that helps. Um, so I visualize those encounters. I, I, I visualize me getting my bear spray out in, in half a second because a bear from 50 yards can be on you in less than three seconds. So you got to be really fast with it. And, and, uh, so I, I visualize those things, um, so that I'm better prepared to do it when it actually happens. So, um, and I've done that, you know, I was involved with search and rescue for a lot of years and, and, uh, it really helps to just to just be able to, to to breathe and not have to think too hard. For you, you just know what to do and you react. And you do that by practice, whether you whether you pr actually practice going through the motions or just practice it in your mind. So, I'm a great believer in that. That's good. I I, I agree with you on visualization. That actually saved my life once, probably when I um, hit an antelope head on with my motorcycle at 70 miles an hour. I had yeah, I just finished a um, a uh, advanced drivers, advanced riders training course, and they had programmed this stuff into us. Right, we did over and over. We braked, and they taught. Here's what you do if if you hit something. You don't want to change the vectors. You want to go straight. You want to glide. You don't want to do anything that takes you off the path that you're already on because you're only on two wheels, and it's real easy to go down. And I remember when I hit all of that. Uh, visual is well visualization I guess is the pre you know having thought it through pr prior thinking through what do you do what do you do it all came up automatically it was amazing um probably saved my butt <laughs> oh well I'm glad I did I'm glad you're here <laughs> well me too so let's go backwards a bit in time so you grew up in Oklahoma um not everybody from Oklahoma makes it to the mountains they you know I've driven across Oklahoma a few times. It's a pretty flat state. So what brought you, what were the conditions, the situation, what's your story on how you got from Oklahoma uh, into the mountains, how you became a ranger? How I know you had an experience up in Alaska. I wonder if you could take us, take us on your journey from Oklahoma to, um, yeah, to the mountains. Uh, well, Doug, uh, as I said earlier, um, I you know, I grew up in a, a large family, and um, it was not a peaceful household. And um, to escape the, the the shouting and and hate and and the vitriol that that seemed to be a pretty much a constant in in the house when when my dad was home, especially. Um, I, I escaped in my mind to the mountains and, and I don't know why I chose the mountains, um, but I did, you know, f pictures, uh, reading books, um, books like uh, Last of the Mohicans, for example, which, I, you know, yeah, it's probably a pretty, pretty cornball book, but it, you know, for a seven or eight year old boy, it was, uh, it was escape to a to another world and and that's what i needed to do so the mountains were literally my salvation um at that point in time so when i was able to move to idaho with my dad and my grandmother in 1973 
Um, it was like a dream come true. So I, you know, all the imagining I had done about being in the mountains, now I finally got to actually be there. And it was even better than I, than I imagined, better than I dreamed. And as soon as I got out of high school, um, uh, I decided not to try to play college football. I went to Alaska instead. Uh, going to Alaska was a dream, a, a literal dream, uh, the, the biggest, wildest place left on Earth. Why Alaska, though? How did you end up in Alaska? Well, because it was the biggest, wildest place on Earth. It was, uh, you know, Idaho was pretty wild, yeah, but not like Alaska. Um, and so I had the opportunity. It's when the pipeline was being built, um, 1976. And I had the opportunity to go work at a, at a lodge. And so I took it, worked in the bush um, for two years and was uh, in the summertime. It was a private lodge uh, in the summertime, uh, had, a, had hunters and or had fishermen and then in the fall hunters. Um, and then um, in the winter, I was alone uh, at the lodge and was able to spend long months at a time alone um, 1976 batteries aren't what they were today. So I, most of the time didn't even have music. Um, I had books, not nearly enough books, but, uh, had books in the Northern lights for my company, um, and moose and caribou, the bears were hibernating then. Um, and just was able to Doug get, uh, get a handle on what I wanted to be, who I wanted to be and, and start asking myself the question if I was who I wanted to be. And all too often the answer was no. So then that begged the question, then how do I become that person? So I've pretty much spent the rest of my life trying to become that person. Let's go into those that um, that period when you're in the spending winters in the lodge. What was that experience like? I mean, a lot of people go bonkers being alone for that much time in a dark, cold place. It, seem to do the opposite for you. It lets you move into an introspective place that basically um, changed your life. Yeah, cabin, cabin fever is real. Um, if you're not, if you're not uh, able to deal with it, you know, the old saying that uh, if you don't like being alone, that must mean you don't like the company. Um, and I, I don't think that's always true, but uh, uh, it certainly gave me the opportunity to uh, yeah, I, I love to explore the the greater landscape around me, but I also love to explore the inner landscape um, inside me, and and uh, and really deal with the hard questions uh, of who I am and and who I should be. And so I was able to. I mean, it was utterly quiet. It was utterly quiet, except when the wind blew, um, and the 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 birds, the the few birds that wintered there. Um, and I, so I was able to focus inward in a way that, uh, cause you know, it's also dark 17 hours a day up there where I was. Um, so a lot of time alone in the dark and the quiet. So how did you spend that time? I mean, take us through the course of a, a typical day where you're being introspective, you're dealing with, obviously there's some things you got to get the fire going and, uh, batteries and all of that. But when you were really in that introspective place, doing the introspection what what were you meditating were you journaling were you reading and then journaling what was what was the process itself yeah pretty much all the above i didn't know to call it meditation at the time um i read i didn't have nearly enough books especially the first winter um and I read a lot of books. Uh, I read all of Dostoevsky's novels and didn't get the full benefit of, uh, yeah, uh, you know, the, the, I was the autodidact who was trying to, trying to um, read great literature without any, without any uh, instruction or direction. And so I spent a lot of time reading things that, that uh, I would have benefited uh, if I'd read them when I went to college later. But um uh, a lot of time, uh, yeah, just sitting, thinking, sitting uh, uh, in silence and just being. I didn't, I, again, I didn't know to call it meditation. Um, during the day, of course, what daylight I had, I had lots of chores. Like I, I had to haul my water up from the lake and um, the lake froze solid. So I had to keep a, a hole open in the water. So I hauled all my, all my water up and uh, that I used in the cabin. Um, 
cutting firewood, cutting building logs because I built a couple of structures while I was there and, and go out and go out on snowmobile and on snowshoes and find, find logs that were suitable for building. And then, then go back and, and saw them down and haul them back. Um, so a lot of, a lot of good work like that. Um, but a lot of time just pondering, uh, which I still do a lot. And some people think it's weird and, and maybe it is, um, I don't care. Um, but I, but I still do it a lot. And, you know, that, that, that quiet time is something that I've always valued and, and still seek out. You know, there is a book called Chop Wood, Carry Water. That's a um, classic on inner, sort of that inner process. So you were actually doing it back in the seventies. <laughs> yeah. I, I've never heard of that book, but I might look for it now. So you emerge from this period of time in the cabins and you know let's call this the dark eh, it's not really the dark night because you really like the process but you come out of it it changes you how did it change you what did you learn in there and how did you apply it Uh, that's that's a good question did it change me doug i um i don't know that it changed me so much as it because i think the foundation of who i was was already there so I think maybe it, uh, and this this is something I'll think about now that you've asked that question. Um, but I, I think maybe it 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 just cemented um, the what my nature already told me I, I needed to be, um, and and you know the lessons that I learned um, to not feel sorry for myself, to that no one could could be happy for me. I, I have a little saying uh, for myself um, in how I deal with things and it's, it's up to me and that's true for everyone. It's up to me. It's up to the individual. If you want to be happy, you can be happy. If you want to be angry, you can be angry. There are all kinds of poisons we can choose in life. Um, self-pity, bitterness, resentment, anger. Um, and so you you choose the way you want to go, and and I chose not to um, partake in any of the poisons, um, but to I chose to be happy, and I chose to try to find the positive in life, and focus on on uh, what I did have rather than what I didn't have. I've never never uh worked towards more material things except i like new skis and a new mountain bike every now and then um so I, that it, it just uh it just it gave me the opportunity to to cement those qualities that i uh, that i thought were uh what i wanted in my life and and uh, to focus on them i haven't always been successful at that certainly um but again that the time now when i when i can sit quietly especially in a in a beautiful place in wild country and think about have i been successful if not why not and what do i what do i do differently um i kind of go back to to the those things that uh that i chose to focus on when i was living in the bush in alaska 40 years ago do you ever feel yourself starting to go down into a dark place or down the rabbit hole? And if so, what do you do to stop it? Or maybe you're just one of those people that doesn't go there. I, you know, Doug, I, I don't spend much time in, in dark places. I mean, I love the night sky. So I love, uh, you know, the actual dark, but, uh, but I, you know, I, well, I, when I, when I had cancer, you know, I had cancer a few years ago, and as soon as I finished my chemo, my wife divorced me. So that was a pretty dark time, um, and I was diagnosed with depression um, and found my way out of that with with some good with some good uh, chemical help, and also just again focusing on what I had, not what I had lost. Um, and I developed a little mechanism for when those dark thoughts would come into my head because I did, I, you know, I did for a while there, um, think about suicide. I couldn't stop it. I couldn't stop that thought from coming into my head. Um, didn't, didn't ever get close to actually acting on it, but I, I just, you know, it was pretty, it was a pretty interesting intellectual exercise for me to, to, to analyze why am I having these thoughts? I don't want to die. I don't want to kill myself. So I developed a little mechanism that when that thought would come into my head, I would, 
I would visualize again, uh, wadding it up like a piece of paper and throwing it right back out and was able to make it through that, that really dark time. And three months after, after my divorce and five months after my last chemo session, I had a gratitude party. I had a party up in the Boulder foothills place, you know, pretty well and invited everyone who wanted to come. I bought a keg of beer and, and, um, ask everybody else to bring potluck food and uh, rented some porta potties and, and had a gratitude party. I put signs up on the highway with the, said gratitude with arrows pointing the way to the place. It's like, I'm going to focus on what I'm grateful for. And I have so many things to be grateful for. And so that's, that's the route I chose. Let's go back to, so you, you do the time in the cabin in Alaska and what came next after that? Well, I, I really wanted to experience uh, as much as I could have liked before I settled down to a career, <clears throat> wasn't really thinking in career terms at that point, but I knew I would eventually. So I, I rode trains for the railroad. I worked for the, for the railroad for a while, for the Missouri Pacific Railroad, riding trains as a brakeman. Um, I worked on an offshore drilling, oil drilling platform in India for a while. A cousin of mine got me that job. Um, yeah, I was, I was intelligent and worked hard and took a lot of initiative. So I usually didn't have too much trouble, um, finding good employment at that point. I hadn't gone to college. Uh, so it was, uh, you know, the old, uh, strong back, weak mind kind of jobs, um, which I was perfectly qualified for. But uh, then I then let's see, I, I uh, um, worked as an iron worker, worked as a carpenter, knew that wasn't what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And then at the age of 31, I went to college. Where did you go and what did you study? I went to Boise State and studied history. And why history? Because I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I thought maybe I wanted to be a professor because I love books so much and I love history and you know, George Santayana famously said, uh, those who ignore the lessons of history are doomed to repeat them. And so I wanted to learn the lessons of history. And it, it's kind of an overlooked subject that has more to teach us than any other, just about any other subject we can, we can study. Um, and I've, I've always loved history. Uh, it was it was uh, intensely gratifying for me and and uh, limitlessly uh, interesting, and I mean to this day that's mostly what I read. I, I read very little fiction. I should read more probably. I'd be a more interesting person if I read more fiction probably, but uh, um, I read a lot of history still, and and so much of what I read resonates today. You know the old saying that uh, history repeats itself is not true. We repeat history because we don't learn the lessons of history. So I chose history and worked summers uh, as a wilderness ranger and the Forest Service hired me just as soon as I finished school. Forest Service hired me permanently as a wilderness manager. So you weren't even concerned about, oh God, I'm going to have a history degree. What am I going to do with that? You just went straight into ranger work. It was what I, history was what I loved and the wilderness was what I loved and I was able to do both. And so, yeah, and the, but the Forest Service offered me a permanent position as a wilderness manager. How in the world could I turn that down? How did you, uh, what was your connection with the Forest Service? Were you working there summers as a? Summers as a, as a seasonal wilderness ranger. Yes, that's how I started. And how did you get that position? Somebody you knew or? Um, I had volunteered some in the Sawtooth Wilderness. And um, so they, they knew me. Um, and knew my my potential and uh, offered me the the summer uh, the seasonal rangers position. I was going to college, so I uh, that was all I all I could do. Um, and so you know, just just volunteering uh, got my foot in the door. Um, when was this? Is this the early eighties? No, this was actually nineteen eighty eight. Oh wow! So when when I met you, I was I think it was around eighty four or eighty five. Yes. Um, what were you doing then? That was when you were doing the volunteering and the. Exactly. Yes, I was volunteering then. So you become a ranger. All of a sudden, there's a responsibility that comes with that: interacting with other people, watching for the interests of. Te, te, what's involved with being a ranger, and what were some of the challenges you had and what did you love about it take us take us into the life of being a ranger 
Well, um, field, uh, uh, I started out as a full-time field going, uh, ranger in the summertime. Um, and of course you spend five to, uh, at, at that time we do 10 days, which is also five to 10 days at a time in the backcountry with a backpack and a Pulaski and a shovel. And if you're not familiar with the Pulaski, um, it's a tool with a grubbing, uh, uh, edge on one side and an ax, a chopping tool on the other side. And you can do anything with a Pulaski. It's the greatest tool on earth. It's the simplest, but, but an amazing tool that you can do just about anything with. So I'd have a Pulaski and a shovel and go out and chop trees out of the trail, do erosion control work, um, clean up people's messes in the backcountry. Um, I had law enforcement, um, uh, authorities. So, when people misbehaved, uh, I could write them tickets. I didn't like to write tickets. I usually tried um, uh, persuasion first. Uh, if I thought they weren't convinced, then I'd be damn right I'd write them a ticket. But um, uh, just spent time uh, in the backcountry taking care of the place, basically, and um, uh, spending a lot of time talking to other people. A lot of people I encountered already knew uh, the value of, of those wild places, but a lot of people were just then being exposed to it. So being able to talk to them about uh, about the environment around them, the, how the ecosystem worked and why white bark pine, <clears throat> excuse me, why white bark pine trees were so important and just great opportunities to, to share my love of the place and how remarkable the place was with other people. And what were the response from those people that you engaged with? Did they, did you see them kind of light up and take on a sort of a deeper, newer appreciation for what was going on around them, or the nature around them? Absolutely. I mean, it was pretty remarkable with some people and, and uh, uh, really fun. One of, the, one of the most gratifying parts of my job was seeing uh, people just gain that deeper appreciation for the place. And one thing I usually tried to do if I had time and, and if they had time, often people were in a hurry to try to get to their destination and didn't have um, a whole lot of time. And I, plus I didn't want to bore them to tears, um, but try to convince them that you know, you're here in this amazing place where the beauty and the stillness and the the the, the perfection of the of the place is obvious. So the things you he, you learn here, this connection that you start to reestablish here with the natural world, take it home and think about the stream that runs through your town because a lot of towns are built on on streams or rivers. It's take it home and try to try to have the same kind of connection with your home and make it a better place too. Because um, again, in, 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 in the wilderness in especially the sawtooth wilderness in the Boulder white clouds um, that, that beauty and the, and the, the, the importance of the environment is so obvious, but we take that for granted at home in, in, in town. So, so much of the time. So try to get them to, to think about, what can I do to a, a yes, uh, protect this place, keep this place holy and pure, but what can I do when I get home to make, to improve my home place as well? Because I think that's one of the great human values of wilderness is, is reestablishing that connection that was severed with, especially with the beginning of the industrial revolution, but, uh, in a lot of ways with the beginning of the, the agricultural revolution, we've severed that connection with the natural world. Um, and I think our salvation, human humanity's long-term salvation is going to be reestablishing that connection and reestablishing the importance of taking care of our home place, um, which we're not very good at. That's why I said earlier that I thought grizzlies were the culmination of, of life, not humans, because we have these big brains, but all we do is foul our own nest with them. So given our political situation right now and this is in 2019 climbing out of the end of the year in fact it's christmas eve christmas eve day is that all right there's a christmas anyways christmas eve in 2019 um how and what are you what's your advice on this like if you could sh um 
well, how do we deal with this polarization that's going on? I'm not sure if I, I want to talk with you too about uh, your encounters with ranchers, sheep, um, you know, predators versus that. But right now, your take on what we need to do and how it can be done in this polarizing, polarized society we have right now. We've got one side that seems to be pro-wilderness, and then we've got this president who seems to be anti-wilderness and is bringing a whole, uh, I don't know what to say. It's frustrating. But anyway, take it away, Ed. <laughs> Boy, that's, <laughs> I wish I had the answer to that, Doug. <laughs> um, I, I think one of the things that we're, that we're suffering from is kind of a tribalism that uh, is inherent to humans. I think that's how we evolved. Um, but we, so it's so easy now, and especially with social media, and especially since uh, uh, Lee Atwater and Newt Gingrich and other people um made politics so freaking tribal. Um, we view people who have different political views than ours as the enemy. And some of them are. I think some of them probably truly are. Most of them are not. Um, I grew up in Oklahoma, a very conservative state, and I still stay in contact with several um, friends uh, and members of my family because all the rest of my family is still in Oklahoma. Um, and then I have a lot of conservative friends here in Idaho. Idaho is another very conservative state. I don't view them as bad people because they support Donald Trump. Now, I really, truly believe Donald Trump is a bad person. I think he is a horrible, despicable, morally bankrupt person um, and, and plays on people's fears, plays on that tribalism to to get the response he want from he wants from people and and they fall for it and it's unfortunate and i don't understand how they can feel the way they do the people who support him but they don't understand how i can feel the way i do either so i stay in touch with them i don't i don't demonize them i don't make enemies of them and and um i don't um i i don't wash my hands of them except when they're when they're just always into name calling and you know then i'm probably not gonna my granddad told me a long time ago to never argue with somebody who's absolutely convinced so i want to view them as fellow americans and i i know most of these people are good people in spite of the fact that they support a very bad person for president um but i'm going to keep talking to them and i want them to understand why i do feel the way i do and I want to understand why they feel the way they do. And I think from that understanding can grow uh, more acceptance. And acceptance is going to result in more communication. And then the things we agree on, uh, we can work towards. Um, there are going to be some things we, we won't agree on, like abortion and gay rights. Um, if my another thing my granddad told me was that if two people always agree, that means one of them is doing all the thinking and I don't do my thinking. I don't do their thinking for them and they don't do mine for me, but we can disagree um, and, and still work towards some good common goals. So specific to working, you know, to being a voice for wilderness and bringing people that aren't for wilderness right now, over to being pro wilderness. What kind of conversation have you had that's been successful? Where where do you go with the conversation? Where do you not go? I mean, I have I have like you, I have conservative friends, and I've not found a way to speak with these people in a way to engage with them to the point where they are willing to kind of move off of the quote unquote political company line of. Um, you know, pro dinosaur fuels, fossil fuel industry, and taking down environmental regulations and opening up the wilderness to more drilling and logging and everything else. How do you, how do you, what do you do? I'm at a loss for words on it. Yeah, you're not going to convince everybody. There's no question. But um, one of the, one of the things I do, and it gets, you know, goes back to um, them understanding why I feel the way I do is is tell them why wilderness is so important to me. 
and then hearing them not not just saying my piece but letting them say their piece why uh, it's it's so anathema to them and often there are misconceptions um, of what wilderness actually is you you've see you've heard the old line wilderness is land with no use well that's pretty easy to debunk um, it's it's land of no roads no motorized vehicles no uh, logging but that's that doesn't mean it's land of no use um, and when you really look at the percentage of even just the western states if you isolate it to just the western states the percentage of land that is designated wilderness I can't tell you off the top of my head I should be able to but I can't I'm sorry what what percentage of the land base is designated wilderness but it's really not much it's a pretty darn small percentage of land that is in their term in their words locked up as wilderness um, so they have all the rest of that all the rest of the land to to, to log and mine and drill and and um, uh, when, when they when they really have to look at the numbers then most of them will admit um, yeah it's it's really a pretty small amount um, and of course, I I always argue that it should be more. And and uh, you know, when it comes down to it, the things the things that we have to have to continue to exist is clean air and clean water, and healthy ecosystems. And and there is no better way to ensure that than wilderness designation. And um, most people will agree uh, that those things are important. Um, they'll say we don't have to have wilderness to have those things and I agree with that wilderness pretty much ensures it but uh, in non designated wilderness in, in areas that are open to mining and logging that's where we come together and say okay you can log here but here are the things we're going to protect when you log you're, you are going to protect water quality we're going to protect wildlife habitat um, things like that and 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 then you that's when that communication becomes so important and hopefully by that time you've established a trust level um and and you understand that that uh, they understand that my goal is not to put them out of business is to protect those things that i think are most important and i need to understand that their goal is not to destroy the land but it's to it's to have jobs and and uh, feed their kids and put 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 uh, a roof over their house or over their heads and and so that's that's when you start understanding that they're not bad people you just you just come from a different place so at a theoretical level this sounds great how's it worked out in actual practice well um it can work, Doug. It can. It's it's not easy. Democracy is not easy. Um, a good example is the winter recreation agreement we we arrived at here in the Wood River Valley. Um, we we had literally uh, snowmobilers burning backcountry ski huts. It was that bad. It was you know there, there was actual arson in the forest um, and people coming to blows and so we put a group of people together and did exactly what I mentioned earlier we started just getting to know each other spending time out on the snow together understanding why what what it was that snowmobilers loved about being out on their machines they spent time understanding what was important to skiers and we started building that trust and that understanding because the snow machiners often thought that the skiers only goal was to get rid of them and the 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 skiers thought that the snowmobilers the only thing they were out to do was destroy their experience and when they started getting to know each other and realizing that you know really the, there are things that are important to, to both groups and they're not always mutually exclusive um then we started working towards a solution and came up with a solution that geez that was over 20 years ago it still holds today because of that trust and that understanding that the, that the two groups developed. So how did you take us through the nuts and bolts of that? What exactly did you do? We invited a group of uh, uh, the, 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 the ski community because the skiers didn't have an organized club. They didn't have an actual organization. The snowmobilers did. So we contacted some influential skiers and said, get three people, choose three people went to the snowmobile club and said, you guys choose three people. And we started meeting regularly. 
and talking through uh, the issues that we had. We went out on um, on skis and then went out on snowmobiles and started really understanding what the each group and I was I worked for the Forest Service, so I was trying to straddle uh, both sides. I, I wasn't taking a side, even though I'm certainly a skier, not a snowmobiler, but I, I did not take sides and just started getting them to view each other as fellow citizens, fellow members of a great community, not as antagonists who are trying to take something from from uh, the other side. Um, it took a long time. It took years. But we finally came to an agreement that uh, still holds today. And and I talked, uh, I, I'm retired now, but when I was still employed, I talked to winter recreation managers uh, all over the West. And, and I would tell them how good a compliance that we had with our snowmobile closures. And they were astounded because nobody else had the same kind of compliance that we did. Okay, let's go back into um, your your later years in the wilderness as a ranger. Um, when you look back on that period of time, what were some of the biggest challenges and what were some of your most rewarding moments and what are your three biggest takeaways as a ranger? Let's see. Let's do those one at a time. The biggest challenges, um, biggest challenges were, uh, A, the bureaucracy. Um, we often, uh, we, the Forest Service often made it harder than it needed to be, you know, the old line from Pogo, we have met the enemy and it is us. Um, and a lot of that came, <clears throat> excuse me, down from the Washington office. But uh, fortunately, the Forest Service is a pretty decentralized organization. And and most of the decisions that actually affected things on the ground were made at the local level, like the, the snowmobile agreement, the winter recreation agreement. Um, and the challenges are also the, the people who just didn't care um, what the what the other users of the public land wanted and just wanted to just wanted to fight wanted to throw rocks fortunately they were a distinct minority but they were often the squawkiest group um, and uh, but I yeah I would uh, I would approach them I always say if we can't defend our decisions we probably shouldn't be making them so I would I would just go say let's go out on the ground and look at what you're talking about and and take them out and and um, get to hear their side of the story. A good example is the project we did on Pole Creek, where we closed a bunch of illegal uh, two tracks and roads and did a lot of restoration habitat restoration. And a lot of people who had been recreating there for fifty plus years were really upset about it. And so I'd ask, say, well, just meet me out on the ground. Let me explain to you why we did what we did. And to a person, they came away uh, not angry anymore, understanding what we did and not necessarily supporting it, maybe wishing we had, we had done it differently, but understanding why we did it. Um, and, uh, so th those are the challenges dealing with the bureaucracy and dealing with the, the, the not heads in the world. And every group has them. It's not unique to motorize. It's not unique to ranchers. It's not unique to environmentalists. Every group has them. Um, the, the, um, the most gratifying, the most satisfying, most rewarding. That was the second question, Doug. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. The, the, uh, of course the, you know, the spending time out there uh, often by myself, but, uh, spending time in the, in that much time in the back country, um, was in, intensely rewarding, but probably the most, the most rewarding was hearing from people who, went to these wild places and it changed their lives. And I heard that a lot over the years. Um, people would write me postcards, write me letters, sent me books. Um, and just, cause I, I would often talk to people about, uh, about backpacking, where to go, things like that. I talked to hundreds of people over the years, they would call for backpacking advice and, and, uh, the, the folks that answered the phones usually sent them to me and, and uh, people would people would call me or write me letters and say that changed my life. I you know I, I'll never look at look at life the same way. I slowed my pace. I I was able to like you said because I would always suggest to them, don't just focus on moving all the time. Take 
time to sit because stillness and silence are both in shortage categories in our in our lives these days there's so much frenetic activity and 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 it's, you know there are all these moving parts and and uh, like Barry Lopez said life or we, we move at such a fast pace these days we didn't evolve that way we evolved in stillness and quiet and you know it wasn't it wasn't that long ago that going 35 miles an hour was unheard of um then just two or three generations ago uh going 70 or 80 miles an hour was astounding and now you know we travel at at 600 miles per hour and and uh we didn't evolve that way and and so when we were when we're able to go back to uh that stillness and quiet we learn lessons we learn things about ourselves and learn things about about life that's impossible to learn and and, and at, at that pace um and if we don't ever take the time to sit in stillness and someone said i forget um uh, blaise pascal i think maybe said the the uh all the problems um with humanity is because men won't sit quietly in their chambers I, I paraphrase that I butchered it I'm sure and and uh, um, and and I agree with that you know people just don't take the time to stop and think it's everything's black and white you you make these you make you give give the the great questions of our existence a, a brief glance and and think you know enough and move on and and that brief glance is not enough um, if we don't think deeply about about who we are where we are, where we're going, who we want to be, then it's really hard to to uh, really know the answers to those. Um, and and so I think um, when when people would, I would encourage people to, to 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 approach their trips into the wilderness with that in mind. And I would hear often from people that yes, I did that, and and yeah, it took me a couple of three days to actually be able to decompress and really feel the the quiet and feel the stillness um but once they did it would have a profound effect on people all right in that place of quiet and stillness which seems to be a place you're very comfortable with what are you feeling what's the experience like there what are you um ah, take us inside your experience of that well if i have something if i have something that's pressing then um it's an opportunity to focus on that like um you know how did i handle that situation and how should i've handled it differently and what can i learn from it um if i don't then i just it's it's really good for me to just sit and let let things come to me um there there was an old um poem that I read once and I don't remember the whole thing. I really wish I could. It was actually on an album cover and I can't remember the name of the album, but it was uh, something to the effect of um, doubt is the prose of the mind. Aspiration is the song of the soul. And then there's another verse and I forget what it was. And then uh, realization is the dance of life. So you have doubt and you have aspiration and that, that, you know, those are the things you, you think about and, and then, but realization where you, where you realize these, these, uh, these important lessons is the dance of life. And, um, so when I'm sitting in those quiet places, I'm really trying to dance. So one of the things I've really appreciated about you, your posts on Facebook is your photography and also the words that you often accompany them with Sometimes you'll lead with our, I think often you'll lead with a quote that you really like, and then you'll rift off of that and take us on a journey with both your words and your images to appreciate um, the wilderness even more. T talk, so maybe you can talk about photography. How'd you get into it? You um, are obviously very good at it. What, how has photography and also this writing um, made you appreciate wilderness even more. How do you look at wilderness differently when you have a camera? How has it maybe altered or changed or deepened or whatever your uh, experience with nature? 
first of all, Doug, I don't know how good I am at it. I, you know, the old saying that even a blind squirrel finds a nut every now and then. I think um, I'm in places that it's really hard to take a bad photo. Um, but I, I do work pretty hard at it, actually. And um, it's it's in a lot of ways, it's like hunting, which I haven't hunted in, in many, many years. I'm not anti-hunting, um, but uh, it's like hunting with a camera. You're hunting for light. Um and, you know, when I, when I first got into photography, it was right out of high school. When I went to Alaska, I bought a camera, I bought a little single lens reflex camera with a 50 millimeter lens, had, had, had no instruction, uh, didn't know what I was doing. It's pretty interesting how much photography has changed because where I, where I was in the bush in Alaska, I would take a lot of rolls of film, but I might not be able to send them out on a plane to get developed because the only access to the, to the lodge was by bush plane. I might not be able to send them out to get developed for two or three months. And then I wouldn't get the film back for another two or three months. So it might be four to six months before I could see what I did wrong. And in the meantime, I'd taken a lot more film, a lot more, a lot more photos, um, you know, probably doing the, those things wrong. Uh, but even then I got some, I got some nice photos, but um, you know, you can contrast that with today where you take a photo and you get instant feedback immediately. You can look at your, your, the, monitor on your camera and say, Oh, I need to, I need to open up more. I, you know, I you know, don't have enough depth of field, what have you. So you get that instant feedback and that's kind of how much, how much technology has changed in, in, in uh, so many areas over the years. But um, it, it may, uh, it's, it's kind of like hiking in grizzly country that, you know, that heightens your senses and makes you more aware of what the wind's doing, where the noise is coming from, uh, you know, no, the, the presence of no other animal on the landscape ch uh, changes your relationship with the land like the presence of grizzly bears. Having a camera in your hand gives you that same relationship with light. What, where is the sun going to set? Where is it going to rise? Where is the moon going to set? And so you, you start thinking about where do I need to be to, uh, to, to, to get the effect that I want with light. So uh, being a photographer is all about a relationship with light uh, on the land. And some days you sit there thinking everything is perfectly positioned for, the, for an amazing sunset and then clouds come up in the west and block the sun and it, you just sit there in awe that you get to be there um, even without the perfect sunset. Um, but it, it does make me more aware of, of uh, what's going on around me. Um, I like to think that there are times when I just, I'm happy to just say, wow. Well, like during the eclipse, we had a total solar eclipse here um, three years ago, two and a half years ago. And the the uh, period of totality was about two and a half minutes. I didn't take a single photo of that because I knew it was going to be so awesome. I didn't want to have to worry about my exposure, uh, you know, my composition, I wanted to just experience the moment. So, so there are times when I just experience the moment and put my camera aside because that's what's truly important to me is, is having that experience in nature. Um, if, if I'm lucky enough to get good photos of it, well, that's a bonus. Um, but I do love photography and I love sharing because I do believe, I know what spending time in these beautiful wild places did for me it literally saved my life doug and if i can help any other people have a similar experience then i want to do that and if i can if i if i can do that through photography and through words because i love to read i read uh a, a lot i i don't uh, i don't watch television I, uh, it's, a, it's a mind sucking um pit i think but um but i love good books and 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 I love words. So if I can show people what wilderness and 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 beauty has to offer, then photography is a really good way to do that. Speaking of books, what are some of your favorite books? Um, and maybe we could break that down into two genres. One would be books um, about wilderness or wilderness related, and then uh, maybe your top three books on that, and then also your top three books on just in general. Boy, the, my top three on wilderness, I guess the ones that come immediately to mind is, are, are uh, Arctic Dreams by Barry Lopez. 
Um, if you haven't read it, I would definitely recommend it. Um, an amazing book, The Practice of the Wild by Gary Snyder and uh, San County Almanac by um, um, Aldo Leopold. And there, there are a few others that could easily be in that top three. So I would probably have more like a top 15 or 20, but uh, those are the first three that come to mind. And then just books in general. Again, I don't read much fiction, but um, one of the, the best books I've ever read is Sometimes a Great Notion by Ken Kesey. Really, uh, I, I think I mean, it, it probably is the best book I've ever read. And, and I, I, I love uh, Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad. Conrad's such a great writer. Um, and it's just a, just a terrific story about, about, um, you know, a, about the, the, uh, exploitation of, of Africa and, and native peoples. And, uh, also about the, what's, what's, uh, the, you know, the, the, the dark that lurks in the, uh, in the heart of, of, uh, men who, who lose contact with, um, with what's important, um, and then um, across the across the wide Missouri by Bernard Devoto, it's a historical uh, account of the fur trade. Um, one of the books that I read at a very early age, and one of the primary reasons I wanted to major in history, uh, it just it just really um, uh, connected me to to uh, you know the great wild Western landscape, and. Um, so that that was a book that that really had a profound effect on me, um, and there there are so many others, Doug, because I do read so much, um, and and uh, so those are just a few that come to mind right off the bat. Something else you just said prior to this is the wilderness saved your life, literally. Can you expand on that? Yeah, I I think I was headed for um, because of. My family situation and no guidance and and uh, you know my family blew up in a in a really bad way, and I I think I was you know I I was could very easily have gone down a very wrong path, but that time when I could when I could just even even when I still lived in Oklahoma when I could just imagine being in a calm peaceful place. Um, allowed me to become calm and peaceful and not not flee to anger, not flee to, to drugs and alcohol, although I did my share of drugs and alcohol. It was more recreational and, and, a, and a learning experience for me, uh, but I never became dependent on them or addicted to them. Um, so it allowed me to, <clears throat> excuse me, to center myself in a way that I wouldn't have otherwise. So then when I actually got to be in wilderness, it it cemented that that uh, uh, certainty. What, what became a certainty of who I wanted to be. I did not want to be a bad person. It would have been very easy for me to have become a bad person. Um, I didn't want to. So being out in the wilderness, out in the in the backcountry, in that in that that calm, peaceful place, in the presence of amazing beauty. Um, just allowed me to gather myself um, in a way that I wouldn't have if I'd been in the inner city, or, or at least I don't think I could have in the inner city. Emerson said, and I'll, I'll butcher this, uh, but Emerson said something to the effect of uh, the great man is he who in the midst of the crowd can enjoy the sweetness of solitude. Well, I'm not a great man. So in the midst of a crowd, I wasn't able to do it. I needed to go away from the crowds and into the wilderness. Um, and enjoy the sweetness of solitude and, and again, um, gather myself and become uh, at least some semblance of the person I wanted to be. And I, you know, I, I'm always falling short of it, um, but I try to always look at that and why did I fall short and, and how can I do better next time? One of the things you said that's really curious here is you were actually retreating into the mountains, so to speak, in your mind before you were even there. Is that what I heard you say? Absolutely. Yeah. No, just looking at looking at pictures of the Maroon Bells, um, of the Grand Tetons, of the Sawtooths, just looking at pictures and imagining being there, placing myself there. I, and maybe that I guess that's when I really started visualizing and, and understanding the power of visualization of, of 
putting myself in a situation and learning from it. Um, so it wasn't visualizing and encountering a grizzly at close range, you know, re reacting to a grizzly charge or, or, um, or being buried in an avalanche, but visualizing being in a place that was completely different from the place I actually was in. And, and it brought me a piece that, that I wouldn't have had otherwise. Wow. That's a great skill set. Um, go, okay, so let's move on now to more recently. You were diagnosed with cancer, is that correct? Do you want to, how has, when you're facing a life-threatening situation like that, it brings death right to the forefront. And it also brings, in my experience, it brings life right just to the forefront. Um, you know, the, all of a sudden, it's not unlimited. It's like, oh, uh, anyway, can you talk about how that has changed you? How, um, what the impact of that's been on you and is specifically towards wilderness too, but also in life? Well, I think um, I, I've always tried to um, uh, to enjoy um the, the, the time I have on earth, I've always tried to um, realize that um, my time is limited and nobody gets out of this alive. Um, but it really, being diagnosed with cancer puts a fine point on that. Um, and at all, you know, I mean, coming, coming face to face with your mortality, my, my cancer was very treatable as it turned out. Um, 10 years earlier, I probably would have died from it. But fortunately, there were some great new um, wonder drugs. And so my cancer was very treatable. Wasn't a pleasant experience. I don't recommend it. But, um, you know, we're not given a choice in those matters. Um, but it really put a fine point on what Warren Zevon said. I don't know if you're familiar with the singer songwriter Warren Zevon, who died from mesothelioma. And he was asked when he was near near death, um, uh, what what if he'd learned any great lessons from from this experience of dying? And he thought about it for a moment and said, "Enjoy every sandwich." And which I I just love because it's not just skiing off the top of a peak or it's not just um uh you know a great steep powder run not those you know not those highlight moments but even the the, the little things enjoy the little things appreciate every breath that you get to take appreciate every time you see a smile on a friend's face um appreciate every sunrise even if it's not blazing with color um so enjoy every moment as much as you can. And, and you're not going to be able to enjoy every moment, but try your best. And, uh, you know, and, and it also was a good opportunity to, um, to really think about, am I afraid to die? And, um, I, you know, I, I truly believe at this point, because I, I, I actually came pretty close to death. Um, I really believe at this point I'm not because it's, I don't have a choice. I'm, you know, everybody, everybody's going to face that. So uh, if I die tomorrow, I've had a damn good life. I've had an amazing life. And so if I, I, I could die tomorrow and have no complaints. I don't want to, don't plan to, but uh, I would have no complaints. Um, but it also makes me appreciate modern medicine. Um, pretty amazing what, uh, what 21st century medicine can do. So your biggest life lessons that you would pass on to others, let's say you're going out tomorrow and you, you could put um, on your epitaph, three key points, three lessons learned, three things that maybe you'd send back to yourself when you were a kid or you would give to your grandkids or whatever. Well, it'd be pretty tempting to, uh, like the old King Crimson song, it'd pretty, be pretty tempting to say that confusion would be my epitaph, but uh, that's not completely true. Um, the first first thing would be gratitude. Be Focus on what you have and, and be grateful for what you have. And if there are things that, that you really um, uh, need to be happy that you don't, that you don't have, then then work towards them but be grateful for what you have gratitude is this for me the the single most important 
thing that I try to focus on. Um, and another would be to uh, be able to distinguish between needs and wants because we are we are absolutely uh, bombarded with with wants in in American society. We are supposed to want all these material things, but what do you actually need? Um, someone said once that uh, half of life's problems could be solved um, in, in by just knowing what we can live without. Um, so the the, you know, the, 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 the 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 simplicity is is uh, a, a great path to happiness. If 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 all you focus on is wanting more, that's the, the, then you, then you're never going to have enough. And so, being able to to say this is what I need, this is what I need to be happy. As opposed to, I'm, I mean, I'm being told by society that I'm supposed to want these things, but do they make me happy? Does that new iPhone 11 Pro, which I kind of want, is that going to make me any happier than the old iPhone I have now? No. So, I, I mean, I didn't even want an iPhone until a former girlfriend convinced me to get one. Now I'm glad she did. Yeah. But um to being able to distinguish between needs and wants. What do you truly need to be happy? As opposed to what society is telling you you should want. Um, and then the third, um, I guess, would just be the importance of friends. Um, I have a saying, I used to make note cards that I would sell in town or, or give to friends. and. And on the back of it, I always had a little saying that the majesty of nature is equaled only by the beauty of true friends. Um, and and so uh, appreciating my friends and wanting to be worthy of my friends, because I have some pretty amazing people in my life. You included, Doug. I include you in this because I have the most respect for you. Um, I, you know, I, I want to be worthy of my friends. And um, so I, I want to... Um, to be a true friend, not just a, not just a, um, a fair weather friend and, uh, to be there when, when they need me because my friends are there when I need them. I found that out when I had, when I went through my cancer and divorce. Um, so I guess those three things, um, are the first that come to mind as far as what I would, uh, um, I don't like to give advice, but what I would say would be things worth considering. Wow. This has been great. Uh, is there anything else? you'd like to add that we haven't covered. And I also want to get your website so people can see your photography and read some of your, uh, some of the things you've written to accompany those photos. Well, on my actual photography website, I haven't written anything. I just, they're just, just, just photos, but that's just edcannadyphotography.com. Um, and then of course, where I, where I have the photos with, um, with words accompanying them is on Facebook and Facebook was kind of my, going to be my loan, um, um, concession to the 21st century. When I got divorced, I didn't know how to be single in the 21st century. I, you know, I thought, geez, I guess I better get a Facebook page, but of course that has nothing to do with it. I didn't know that turned out instead to just be a great way to connect with, with people, um, and to share those to share those uh, um, thoughts and, and photos of beautiful wild places. Um, but so yeah, the, my photography website and then Facebook are the two, the two uh, exposures I have to the greater world. Are you on Instagram at all? I am not. Okay. I Don't might plan. try. Well, I might try to encourage you otherwise, but we'll, <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't be the only one, but uh I don't, we'll the, last thing I need, the last thing I need is to spend more time on a keyboard or on a, a screen. Yeah, well, we'll have that conversation next summer over a beer. <laughs> okay, sounds good. I'm buying this time. <laughs> Ed, thank you so much for uh, taking some time out to share all of this. It's uh, been quite a journey for you. Well, Doug, it's always it's always fun for me to talk to you. I've I've known you for a long time, like you said earlier, and and uh, always really enjoy the time I get to spend with you. Thanks for listening to this episode of What Really Matters: Interviews. 
You can listen to other episodes on iTunes, Spotify, and whatreallymattersinterviews.com. And be sure to subscribe to us so you can hear the latest interviews.